Hey, what's up, everybody? What's going on? It's your girl, Different, and welcome to Different Spoil. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day like me. Oh, man, when they say March Madness, they not lying. This month has been full of madness, man. I have so much going on. I dropped so many vlogs back to back. I'm getting so many responses. Thank you guys so much for your love and support, all the people that are subscribing. Not many just yet, but I do appreciate all the ones that I do have. I'm very grateful for each and every last one of you guys. Thank you so much. Um, as you guys saw me at the beginning, I dropped, you know, some uh, vlogs for International Women's Day. We did my travel vlogs for Ireland and Colombia, as well as the podcast with the Unfiltered Show, podcast show. And so here, we're going to close this uh, month out, the month of March, uh, with our inter interview we did with this awesome dude, um, a former, uh, he's, not, he's a veteran, <laughs> um, but he's overcome a lot just like me, you know, PTSD, homelessness, blindness, alcoholism, drug addiction, you, you name it, he's he's overcome it, man, and uh, he, he calls himself a lot of names, you know, the low-tech redneck, but I, I mostly like him calling himself the comeback coach, and so uh, Richard Kaufman of uh, the Vertical Momentum Resiliency Podcast Show. That's the name of uh, the podcast that I was on. So be sure to check him out on all the podcast platforms that he is on. I'll drop his link below in my bio. Um, but not holding you guys up much longer. Let's get into it. Here is my audio interview with Richard Kaufman, the comeback coach of the Vertical Momentum Resiliency Podcast Show. Check it out. Guys, this young lady that I'm about to have on, I'm so excited to have on her. She is the ultimate comeback story and in the back of my mind i can hear the rocky song playing she's just so amazing coldwell different what's up how are you doing today thank you richard thank you for having me hey everybody out there listening yes my name is different spelled d-i-f-e-r-n-t <laughs> that's my name i and love I'm it so excited to be here thank you so much for that compliment oh, comeback the, coach. <laughs> I, I, I love a comeback story and yours is the ultimate comeback story and I kind of want to hit everything. I, you know, I definitely want to hit on your book, What a Controversy Paradigm Shift. I also want to talk about you, what it's like being a female, not only a female CEO, but a woman of color CEO company. I want to get into that. But first, talk about where you're from, um, where you grew up, and what kind of little girl were you? Okay, cool, cool. So, again, like I said, my name is different. I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm 30 years old. Um, as far as my hobby goes, I love traveling, reading, writing. I'm a daredevil type personality, so I do anything adventurous. I love zip lining. Um, I, once, I think I went parasailing. I do a lot of, like, daredevil stuff when I travel. Um, as far as, you know, my background and coming up, I had a pretty good upbringing up until the time I was around 11 years old. And then me and my family, we basically ended up on the streets um, for the next three years, literally everywhere, literally um, bus stops, shelters, strangers, relatives, cars, show, uh, uh, even a crack house at one point. But um, at the time, what, I was, what was that like? Because uh, like I said, I want to go deep a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why they called me the, the male Oprah. I like to go a little <laughs> deep, uh, you know, because I've been homeless and I, I it is. But, you know, from I moved around probably 11 or 13 different times before I hit high school. And I never oh, wow. made and, and I never made friends. I, Same you know, here. So well, it was hard for me to make friends. I was it wasn't a problem to make friends. It was the fact that it wasn't going to last long. And so for me, it was no point. So I stayed to myself. So but what was that like moving? You know, what was it like moving to all these different places and having to carry everything that you own? Because, you know, I was a, I was an emergency foster care parent for a while. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was in foster care as well. But well, it was hard. I'm not going to – it definitely wasn't easy. And as a child, you don't understand everything, what's going on. And looking back on it, it just, you know, it was just a roll of the dice and how the way the world worked at times. And um, we did this for three years, you know, just sleeping, you know, basically pillow and posting. But it wasn't until the time I was 14. Um, I think it, it, it was – a terrible thing that happened, but it was a blessing in disguise. A family member of mine secretly placed me in foster care and didn't tell the rest of my family members where I was for six months, for the first six months that I was there. And so during that first six months, I spent, you know, my dad was trying to come home, but then I found out that if you age out of care in the state of Texas, 
they will pay for your tuition fee waiver to college. And so then the light bulb went out of my head and, you know, I'm thinking, do, 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 do. what do I do? Do I go back to the streets where I'm homeless or do I stay here in the CPS and do get out for the next four years? When I get out, I'll have a full ride to college. And so I right then and there made that decision that I was going to stay and deal with whatever, you know, the mishaps that, you know, being in foster care dealt with rather than going back to the streets. Now, can you go, because a lot of people, you know, we hear about the foster care system, but we, I want you to give us an inside look into what the foster care system well, is really it's, like. You get lost in the system. Basically, you just, you don't, you're not a person anymore. You're just another case number. And for me, like you, Richard, I moved around extensively before. By the time I graduated, I've already been to 16 different schools, not high schools, but just throughout my educational you know, tenure. Up until the time I graduated, I've been to 16 different schools. So that right there in itself, it does something to, you know, your your, your trust with people and building, you know, your people skills. And so for me, like I said, I say to myself because it was no point in me, you know, getting to know people and have these relationships. And then one day I'll have to believe, which was true. Um, I got kicked out of every foster home I was in because looking back on it, it just coming up in the environment that I was brought up in, chaos was normal to me. And so when I got taken out of that, the, that environment, got placed in another environment, which was actually pretty nice. I was placed in really nice homes and good school districts. However, like I said, I wasn't used to it. For me, it was too good to be true. And so I just kind of got that notion that, you know, I'd rather be the captain of my own ship and decide when it's time for it to go down. And so all throughout, you know, my teenage years, I would just sabotage and, and break off relationship and, you know, push people away. And that would spill over into my adulthood. And so um, those type of things, you know, when you're in the system, you know, you, you can you, you already come into the the foster care system with issues, but when you leave, it's like you have that and then some. Okay, so now I got to ask you a question because um, I'm get, delving deep into mindset and I'm really taking a course now on imposter syndrome. So I just wanted to know what your thought was the first day of starting college at um, Houston State. It was exciting. It was scared. Um, I didn't know anybody. And the last foster, the foster home person I was with, I had got kicked out of her house. She literally like pushed me out of her house and locked the door. And um, like I said, when things were too good to be true, I was smart them. So when it came time for me going to college, I was I was afraid. I was scared that you know that person wasn't gonna stick with me to the end, and so I messed up that relationship. And going into college, I had nobody, and that brought on a, another stem, a stack of issues in itself. I had issues going throughout college that I had to deal with, you know, including with my people skills now, because you know everybody, you know, I'm giving that impression that you know I'm rude, I mean, I'm not a you know a nice person, which is the complete opposite. Um, but by God's grace, I, I made it through that and made it out of that situation. And, and, and as a result, I now have my bachelor's degree in international business. I also have two minors in economics and business communication. I also have my master's degree in entrepreneurship. Not to mention, I'm also a Texas real estate agent. So nothing that I went through in the past was in vain. You know, it was all God's plan. Now, uh, tell me, you know, because coming from where you came from, you know, obviously you didn't. The only kind of people you've probably seen that were entrepreneurs, like when I was growing up, were drug dealers and stuff yeah. like that. So what was, you know, your thought process when you had to pick out your classes? What, when did you decide and why did you decide hmm, business? Well, I've always been a business like minded person. Even coming up, I was before, you know, ended up, you know, going through hard times. I was actually a Girl Scout and I was one of the top best sellers, <laughs> if you will. Um, and I've, I've always had that business mind aspect of it. So I, I knew that I was going to go to college even, you know, as a little kid. And I was going to go into business. Um, another part of that is, you know, just my love for travel. I'm, 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 even going to school, I got that opportunity to travel abroad. I went to Kim Young University in South Korea and spent the semester there. And so um, I've, I've always had that, that business personality that's always been me. And so... Yeah, I, I knew who I am and what I wanted to do. 
Yeah. So did you ever have, because I know I still struggle with imposter syndrome. Has there ever been a time you've been sitting there in the class and you just look around and you're like, wait a minute, I don't look like a lot of these people. Oh, yeah. I, that's not just within the class. And, that's and even I know, after I graduated and, and, and coming into the workplace. And then I started out in the oil industry and just feeling like I didn't belong there. I squandered that opportunity. So sitting in class in a new environment and, and people that, that have higher status than you, of course, that makes you feel inferior. But I had to, you know, re, I had to get it in me to reprogram my mindset and, and, and know that I am worthy of those things that anybody else is going after. I'm just as good as the next person. That's what I had to tell myself to get through it. So now at this time, were you reading books? Were you, you know, listening to people like I'm a, I'm a big personal development guy um were you doing any of that to yes keep- in a matter of speaking as far as like business preparation getting myself prepped for business um also when i was in sam houston i started a student organization called pay it for it and we had three sections you know dealing with volunteering education and mentorship um and so with that i used that as my my first foundation to get started in motivational speaking and so when I would go to different high schools and speaking with students about the you know, importance of education and you know, what I went through and share my story, um, I would share that with you know, the audience, the people around. So that, 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 I'm sorry to get off time for that aspect. It's like I said, it's just always been with me. Um, yeah. So who are some of your, like some of my favorite speakers are people like E.T., Eric oh. Tom? I, I me mean, honestly, as far as like reading books, I don't I don't go by the speakers. Um, I like Dave Ramsey. Have you heard of him? He's like the financial guru. I, I actually went through Financial Peace University. Uh, <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I like reading books like from him with Dave Ramsey and um, who's the other guy I'm reading on investments? I love reading investments book. I'm I'm really a true nerd at heart. <laughs> so um, as far as like motivational speaking, who 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 do I? I, I use everybody as an inspiration. I'm like, I, I don't idolize anybody or have anybody specific like I, I strategically look up to. But if I hear somebody's story and I, I see, you know, that how they where they came from and how they made it out, and, you know, of course that inspires me and stuff. But, um, so now take me to the day you graduate because, you know, um, a lot of times as soon as you get a person gets their um, diploma, they're out in the real world and they're like, okay. Now what? I have a degree. What do I do with it? So what so, would you Like everybody else who graduates and gets out of college, they don't use a degree directly. For um, I actually like yeah, like you said, I was dazed and confused, didn't know what to do. Um, I actually I started with a temp agency and then somehow ended up in the oil industry. So it it I didn't know what I was going to do when I first came graduated out of out of San Houston, but I knew that it was going to be in business. And so eventually, you know, I, I found my niche as well as I was always into real estate. And so um, I just, you know, just started gaining my bearings. And, and, and when working in the oil industry in January 2015, um, they had the crude oil crisis and then they let us all go. And so um, that kind of like rocked my ship right there. They left me, you know, working with a temp agency for, uh, I think I did that like two, three years and then got into, you know, leasing. But yeah, just like everybody else, I had to find my way. Okay, now I, I love real estate. Now, you know, the first thing, couple books I ever bought was a book, a couple books by Robert Kiyosaki talking about real estate. And uh, so, but I've also noticed that a lot of people that sell real estate don't own real estate. Mm-hmm. So, well, I want to own real estate as well. Okay. Um, Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying because, you know, sometimes the reason why people are called real estate brokers is because they're broker than me. So, <laughs> you know. I never heard of that, but that's funny. So sometimes, you know, being in, in a real estate agent, you definitely have to be a people person. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how did you, you know, I know we, back in college, you, you had you, you had to come to Jesus moment sometime where you're like, mm-hmm. all right, I got to change. And so what was that moment when you're like, okay, I don't Actually, for me, it didn't happen until later on. Because like I said, the childhood traumas and those traits 
carry on into my adulthood. So when I would have those good opportunities to advance my career, I would have those notes in the back of my head, you know, telling me, oh, you're not good enough, or they're not going to like you, you're going to too country, you're going to time to get up. And there was an incident, I think I was around 26, 27 years old at the time. Um, I had a meeting with a, a well-connected individual who, who basically could just open up doors and take me places. However, um, just dealing with those demons in the back of my mind telling me I'm not good enough, I specifically, you know, showed up late to the meeting and it left a sour taste in that person's mouth. And to this day, I regret that. But it was there, right then and there, that I had to face the ugly truth about myself. So, and and to go that I need to go get help and fix my issues. You know, whatever childhood trauma I had went through, it was affecting my adult uh, life, and so I needed to fix that. And so, for me, my coming to Jesus moment is when I, you know, accepted the fact that I needed therapy and started taking myself to therapy. Um, coming up in the African American community, some of us. The culture we, we are taught that you know what goes on in this house stays in this house so we can't talk about our issues that's you know we we're dealing with at home and that stems into your adult life you get that notion that oh i don't need a therapist I need my business or whatever and so i just had to dismiss that thought and that notion and do what i have to do and, and i'm glad that i did it i've been in therapy consecutively now for two years going um and, and it's probably one of the best decisions that I ever made um, because when I did that, everything else was able to fall in line. You know, I was able to actually really get on track and be serious with my business, uh, with myself, um, and, and just fix my relationships, you know, with people. And so um, that that was for me my coming to moment, Jesus moment. Now I come from a big Italian family. And obviously, you know, a lot of us were mobbed up, mm-hmm. you know, and if we said we were going to go for therapy, they would be like, wait, wait, hold on. You can't talk to nobody. <laughs> so I loved in your bio because um, what happened was um, when I was living in Pennsylvania, um, I was homeless at one time and a colored family brought me in and I lived with them for a couple of years and they taught me the culture. And they taught me, you know, about, you know, the grandmother is always the matriarch, Mm -hmm. you know, and I got to learn it. So when you wrote in your bio to me, you know, black people don't do therapy. I heard they, I must have heard that at least five or six times when Mm -hmm. I was, and and now the funny thing is they're all in therapy. (laughs) But I've been in therapy now nine years consecutively. And I think it's, it's one of the greatest things ever. Yeah. You know. And I, I say this, anybody out there listening and that's hearing this, you know, and that's feeling the same way, but, you know, still feeling too ashamed about it, don't be. It's it's okay not to be okay, but don't sit there and not be okay. Go fix it. I'm telling you, because at the end of the day, although, you know, what you went through, it might not have been your fault. Somehow, some way, it's your problem, and it's on you to fix it. And that's the ugly truth that we all have to accept. A lot of us say, well, oh, if this person would have did that to me or, or they apologize to me. No, in actuality, they don't really owe you anything. That's just the way the role of dice goes. People, you know, do things to each other and it's on that person, you know, to, to heal. Because that other person is going to go on with their life. They're not worried about you and what you think and how you feel. So it's on you. And so... Once you do that, whatever you do, however you do it, talk to a family member, a friend, um, take up a hobby, or even, you know, call a hotline. You know, if you don't want nobody to know who you are or, or you know, that, that, they still have the hotlines out there available. Um, this week is Suicide Prevention Week, and, and, and with my business, I'll talk about that a little bit more. We touch on issues such as these, you know, with mental health and, and, and you know, domestic relationships and injustice and systemic racism. And so I'm really big on issues like this, you know, talking about, you know, the importance of mental health and, and you know, suicide prevention. And so um, that, again, like I'm saying that to anybody out there that's listening, you know, it's okay to not be okay, but just don't sit there and not be okay. Then that's where the true problem is. You know, once you know that it's a problem and you need to fix it, and you don't want to fix it, then it is your fault and your problem. I love that, you know. Now, um, 
I'm so, I'm so involved in your words that um, I just love what you're talking about. You know, when you but when you go to therapy, you know, a lot of times it rips off the band aids. Oh and yeah. Have to um, deal with the issues. You know, like a lot of people I talk to that I've had on the show recently, and I just did an episode of, um, last week, and she dealt with sexual trauma. And um, a lot of times, in order for us to start healing, we have to rip off that 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 well that scab, mm-hmm. start to heal. And then you know we also like my, one of my mentors. He says you know that nothing happens to you. Everything happens for you, mm-hmm. and everything's a teachable moment. So if you think you know about like he said in your bio, you know if you. Th- you can turn your hurts and, you know, like they say, God never wastes a hurt. You know, you can ter- turn your hurts into a, a, your weaknesses into a strength. So talk to us about how you talk about how to, you you know, use your mess. Your message is now your, your mess is now your message. So talk mm-hmm. about that. Yeah, so in, in picking up where I left off with it being in therapy now, and shout out to my therapist, who is now my mentor, and who, who has, you know, helped me and worked with me and helped me face the ugly juice and Tommy, you know, gave it to me gritty and raw, and, and that's what I needed. Um, and so with one of the methods he encouraged me to do is to get back to one of my loves, which was writing and journaling, and so that's what I did. And so just writing affirmations, you know, and, and self-assurance to myself, that also helped. Um, and, and so in doing so, this is how the book happened. <laughs> um, one day, you know, I'm just doodling, uh, taking back to the beginning of the pandemic. We stuck in the house. There's no way to go. Um, you know, sitting here dealing with my issues. And, you know, the death of George Floyd happens. And of being from Houston, of course, you know, I wanted to be involved in, you know, he grew up in Third Ward. I'm from Fifth Ward. He's from Third Ward, but we're right down the street from each other. And so um, when he passed, I wanted to get involved and, and have my voice heard. However, you know, when it came down to it, I felt, you know, I wanted my voice to be heard longer than just in that moment of time. And so going home later on that night, praying, talking with God, you know, being spiritually in tune. And, and just, you know, asking him what it is that I can do to, you know, contribute to society in a way that's going to make them, you know, think, you know, actually, you know, think about the things that's going on and have my voice being heard on that I'm gone. And so when I did that, God would, you know, send me little messages, little dreams, you know, talking with people here and there and then watching TV and then just one day doodling in my journal. I just started writing, you know, what if, what if this, what if that? every day little by little piece piece by piece and um it started in june 2020 by december 2020 i was finished with writing section of the book and so um it didn't take long it's not a long book it was less than uh, 100 pages but um once i reach out to my lawyer she tells me oh this is a great book i think it's going to do good sales but you know one question what's the name of your business and uh, I kept telling her, <laughs> I kept telling her my uh, my book <laughs> as the name of my business, but she broke it down for me a little bit more. And she explained like, well, she, in order to have a product to sell to the uh, public, you have to have a business, which was true. And it didn't dawn on me that I would need to have a business. But I was just trying to write the book. And so, there and on, you know, December 2020 and then to March 2021, um, I had to, you know, do all my homework and research, and you know thinking of what my company is going to be and what we were going to be about and what we were going to bring to the public, the public because now it's just bigger than just a book. It's more than that now. And that's just the way God works. Sometimes you, you think you're doing something small, but really he has something big planned for you. And so that's just what's happening in my life right now. And so as of March 2021, I have my business, Third Eye Entertainment, LLC. And what we are about is a business that brings social awareness to society, through our products and services that educates, inspires, and entertains all at once. We also have a model that we live strategically by. It's called Manifest, Plan, Prepare. And this is why, in order for, we believe, in order for one to achieve guaranteed success in life, they must manifest 
The first step is manifest what it is that they want and believe and desire in their heart. Speak it into existence like no other. Remove all of those fears, those doubts, and replace it with faith. Assurance that you will reap your benefit if you keep the um, keep stay the course and don't get distracted. So manifest it with all your heart and soul and your mind. Speak it out, write it out, believe it, receive it, and and, and then it will eventually come to you. The next step you must do is plan. Write, get a get a plan of action of what it is that it, that you want to achieve in life. Write it out on paper. And, 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 and then on top of that, I'm sorry, give me one second. Um, I'm sorry. So then secondly, once you plan what it is that you want, whether, you know, you getting that house, that car, you know, getting that girl, that man, plan for what it is. Get a plan of action how you're going to achieve that goal. Second, then third, you prepare for what it is that you are about to receive. So when I say prepare for what it is that you are about to receive, prepare your finances, prepare your mental health, prepare your physical health, your spiritual, your emotional. Go mend those broken relationships you had in the past so they don't affect your future. You know, get your finances in order, all of that. So when you prepare for what it is that you are about to receive, then it will come to you. So manifest, plan, prepare. The pandemic has taught me, and, and I'm getting a little shaky about this, I do apologize. Um, I've lost four people this year alone. Four people. I don't want to lose any more. But with the pandemic, it has taught us that, you know, life is short and tomorrow is not promised. So whatever it is that you want and believe in life that you are supposed to have, now is the time to go after it. Now more than ever. You know, I always tell my friends, I, you either got that mindset that you're trying to have that come up like Cardi B or that come back like Robert D. There is no more empathy. It's time to get rich during the pandemic or die trying. And that, that's exactly what I'm doing. And so with that being said, our, as far as our services side for Third Eye Entertainment, we also, like I said, offer the motivational speaking side. We talk about issues. I offer you know, a, a blogging and a blogging section. To where we talk about the type of issues that like to get swept under the rug, such as you know injustice, systemic racism, suicide prevention. We talk about mental health, wellness, um, child advocacy, such as with sex trafficking, foster care, voters' rights, women's rights, LGBTQ issues, everything. We talk about all those issues and try to bring them to light and bring social awareness and create systemic change. Um, with that being said, our first product on the line that we have for the public is my new book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift. And before I go any further, let me say this with this book. It does include a disclaimer. Um, it's intended for a mature audience only. This book was written strictly to inform and encourage thought-provoking conversations about systemic racism and injustice in America. Um, the ultimate goal of this book, not only to push the envelope for conversation, but to remind the world and people that will read this book, you know, about just to have, you know, compassion for, you know, humanity and be loving kindness to one another because we all have, you know, personal battles that we're dealing with that you know, nobody knows, whether it be, you know, in our personal relationship, our finances, where we're struggling with our weight, our sexuality, it's something that we're all struggling with on the inside next person doesn't know so why not you know show kindness and compassion for one another just because and so with what if a controversial paradigm shift um, like I said it's written to encourage systemic conversations about racism in America it's done through graphic but provocative illustrations and it entails on um, controversial deaths and events that have occurred in America within the African American community the way that I have set the book up is in four main categorized paradigm shifts, historical, political, precedent, and hypothetical. And within those four main paradigms, those are sub-paradigms that I offer. And I ask the question, you know, what if this? Basically just asking the question, what if this happened to white people instead of black people? And you said that with me, Richard? Um, I'm listening. <laughs> I know I well, talk too much. I'm so sorry. No, but that's... Feel free to cut in and let me know, because no, I feel like I talk too much. Well, because I'm interested in this conversation. <laughs> you know, okay. I was in the military for over 23 years. Uh -huh. And, and, and were, the people that I knew 
even though I was down south, um, in the military, there was no black, there was no white. You know, mm-hmm. you get shot at, bullets yeah. don't know what color you are. We all going to bleed the same. Exactly. Everybody, you know, everybody's green. And in my book that I put out, um, I talk about how I was healed from being a racist back in 1986. Mm-hmm. And I, my, my ways, were, my thoughts were changed. And now, like, I have a friend, his name is Joe. He's a police officer, and he's in a color. And somebody once called me up and like, hey, do you know Joe? And I'm like, Joe, 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 Joe. And I'm thinking, you know, police officer, he's a police officer. So uh, I said, yeah, Joe Hammond. And he's like, the black cop. I was like, and I, in my mind, I mm. didn't realize he was black. Because we're, we're just family. We've been family for years. Yeah. So, you know, I think in America, you know, we, we are so divided. That's why I wanted to have you on, because I love the conversation. Because only in America can a 53-year-old white guy sit down and talk with you and mm-hmm. just have a, 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 a loving, caring conversation. I love it, too, and I'm so grateful for you having me. You were actually the first Caucasian person to have me on their show to talk about that issue, so I'm so grateful for you having me on your show. And, and I knew that... that no matter what this book will cause, it's going to attract the right people like you and so many others, you know, that's of non-color, but know that there's an issue with racism that needs to be fixed. Yeah, but, you know, so, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. You know, even in the African-American community, I have a lot of friends. I grew up in, you know, uh, some of the high schools I went to. I was like the only white guy. So mm-hmm. I, I learned a lot that. A lot of times, I mean, if you take out what, what's said on Facebook and twi- Twitter and Instagram, all that stuff, mm-hmm. um, if a certain, you know, somebody's doing good in your community, you know, other people of the community are going to try to bring you down, mm-hmm. no matter what color you are. Mm-hmm. So talk to us about, you know, because I, I believe that there there is racism, but there's also, you know, racism against Italian people. Uh, there's no. racism everywhere and this book yeah. is not just well, let me say this Richard it's not just for blacks or whites this yeah. book can be applied to any to any paradigm not just with race yeah. let's see if you want to talk about gender what if this happens to men instead of women or let's talk about sexuality you know what if this happened to gay people instead of straight people yeah. so you can take these paradigms and you can apply it to any other you know situation if you like but for me I chose you know racism because yeah. you know that's a really deep seated issue and you know a uh, uh, issue that needs to be addressing this that's near and dear to my heart um I, i've experienced racism you know not only in america but even when i'm overseas but it's worse when i come home that's the funny thing about it yeah like oh like today or tomorrow 11 you know yeah tomorrow will be september the 11th and and it's going to be a sad day and i, I hope you know that I, I will say this let me with even though the 9 11 was a very tragic thing I've never seen so many blacks and white come together over one issue like that. And it sucks that it takes these type of issues to bring us together. And where I'm sitting right now, I'm actually overlooking where the Twin Towers once stood. Oh my God. And, you know, and I say, you know, the best. Just at Ground Zero last summer. The best day in America, in my opinion, was September 12th, because that's when we were one America. Yeah, it was no black, no white. Yeah, I remember that. It was, yep. it was all, you know, we were all red, white, and blue. Yep, I was I was in the fifth grade when that happened, and um, everybody came to school the next day, and we were just all hugging each other. I can't. I, I grew up in a very diverse city, so um, luckily, coming from the south and in Houston, that's this probably like the most urban city in the south, if you will. And so I was blessed to, and as well as I have, you know, a mixed family group. You know, my grandmother is actually a white woman, a white Native American woman who loves black men. And so with this book, I definitely want to, you know, don't get it misconstrued. This is no attack on any Pacific race. This book is not instructed as a tool or an instrument that's to be used as, as some, one of the persons I read to review said that, um, this book is going to be used as a tool for the black community to uprise against the white folks. No, it's not. This is simply a book to make you think, what if, you know, and if this ruffles your feathers or rings your bell, then obviously there's something's there, you know, because if it's okay, if it's not okay for, you know, a picture or illustration of a white person, you know, being lynched or shown, you know, that, but then you turn around and see a black person being lynched, you 
you have excuses and justification of why it is, then that's how you know that racism is still alive. Yeah. But for and me, enough about that. I'm, I'm tired of talking about systemic racism. Yeah. So let's talk about systemic change. That's the real main point of my book, systemic change. I, I, I get your attention with the gritty and grimy illustrations, but if those who, who are mature enough to stomach through the entire book and make it to the last paradigm, hypothetical, there is where it's all tied in. You know, that's why I bring it home. home. Those are my main points. You know, what if we all come together, you know, just as one and just talk about the issue? Let's just take some time to acknowledge it. You know, a simple acknowledgement that it's still there is, a, you know, a step in, in, in towards the right direction, if you will. And even if I'm well aware, you know, that change doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen with just one person. So it's going to take all of us to do more than just me and you and, and, and others, you know, who march at the protest. And, and again, I'm aware that, it, you know, this may not go nowhere, but at least, you know, we try. Nothing beats a failure but a try. And for me, I, I, I'm, I'm living off the, the hope that, you know, what if this is the generation, Richard, that plans to seed for the next? It may not come during our time. I don't think it will. That's just my honest opinion about it. It's probably not going to change anything until, you know, for the, for the next generation. But what if this is the generation that plans to seed? What if this, is, what if this book is, is a part of it, you know? You'll never know unless you, you know, put your best before you try. And, you know, I, like, I have a nine-year-old daughter. And uh, we, we have got together with, our, with some family and friends and hung out for um, Labor Day and had a barbecue. We were talking about the same issue, this issue right here. Mm -hmm. And my point was, if you take 100 kids, ages 5 to 10, mm -hmm. and put them in a playground, they're all going to play together. Oh, yeah. They're all going to make friends. They don't care what color you are. They don't care, you know, where you're from. And I believe that racism, on, in any on any level, it's taught. It's not something that's naturally ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. But like you said, we have to start with you know our my generation, your generation, and my mm -hmm. children's generation to start believing that in you know in this America we have more things in common than we have not in common. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we need to start having conversation, sitting along the kitchen, across the kitchen table, breaking bread and just sitting down and having conversations. And I think that's what your book is about, is about mm -hmm. starting conversations. Yep, exactly. And also just just the fact that, you know, to, to put it out there, you know, again, even though I'm talking about racism in this book, my ultimate message is just to have, you know, show compassion for one another. You know, what if this happened to you or, you know, your family member? What if this was still happening? And so I, I can't even say no more. You know, you, you said it all for me, Richard. <laughs> well, you know, because like I, like I said, I lived with this family for three years and they would tell me about their, you know, their, their grandparents and their mm -hmm. grandparents coming from Georgia. You know, working on plantations. You know, doing. Ah, okay. So, so you put what we call in the culture woke. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's like I, I can understand because yeah. I sat with them and I broke bread and I prayed and I I learned and I think that sometimes we just appreciate. Yeah, other and honestly, Richard, I think we we definitely need more people like you who who are like that and have those experiences. Not just saying like a, as far as like a, you don't have to assimilate our culture. But just have to just sit down and talk with us and see, you know, ask us about us and what it is that, you know, makes us upset and why we're upset. And and you will learn and, and understand. And I think just like how you said, like when people talk with you and, and I guess laced you up on game and how our culture are, you were able to understand us better, right? Well, yeah, I mean, but, and like I said, like, I grew up in the 80s. I'm just, I'm, I know I'm old. <laughs> but, like, if I go on my, my playlist on my iPhone, you know, there's Tupac, there's Big, mm -hmm. you know, there's okay. NWA, you know, Too Short, stuff like that. Oh, <laughs> but I'm saying, stuff, but, you know, I understand all aspects of the culture. And I think some people are afraid to try to understand different cultures. Like me, I, 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 I like that kind of music. Then I was like, well, where did that music come from? So then I went back to the blues and mm -hmm. then I went back into jazz to find out where all this came from. And I think a lot of people, they're called, I call them Facebook generation. They don't do any research. Mm -hmm. They don't read any books. 
they don't watch documentaries about you know what, what our parents our great grandparents have went through you know what I mean? mm-hmm. okay now i got a question for you because this is yeah. like, we're having a great conversation awesome yeah like a lot of people I know, especially women of color, strong women of color, mm-hmm. they hear a lot of uh, certain music, and they hear the B word going out, the the whole word going out, and and the N word going out. Mm-hmm. And they're starting to really fight against it. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you feel when you hear music like that and those words being used? Um. In the beginning, as a child, you know, when you come up, you don't really think of the things like that. It's just, you think of, oh, hey, it's a great song, good beat, you just want to dance. As I got older um, and, and listening to the lyrics and, and, and what they represent as, as far as like mom culture, I'm, I'm not okay with it, but I understand it is what it is. And it's just, for me, I've told myself it's not what you call, it's what you answer to. And so for me, I know who I am who they sang about in those songs, those bitches, those, excuse me, I'm sorry, those bees, those hoes, those, that's not me. They're not talking to me because I uphold myself. I respect myself. And so if I don't act like that, then I know that doesn't, you know, that's, that, that's not directed to me. And for me, it's just a song. I'm singing it. I do see or and see how, you know, some of the women of, I just, you know, attack on nobody in our culture. I'm not bashing anybody. This is my personal opinion. That's my. If you ask me a question, and I'm giving you my opinion. Yep. Um. I've. I've. And again, this is where it goes back in facing that ugly truth and, and, and admitting it to yourself. But I do see how you know us women have. It's because you know we've condoned it so long that you know it's it's a norm now, and, and people are used to it. Uh, I. I wish more women like me and myself and, and, and others that 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 are against you know female bashing would speak up more about it. But you have to understand in that culture that's that was that's what sells you know making the money you know that type of music sells. Um, it, it's this <laughs> it's, it's touchy to see because I don't agree with it, but I'm not gonna sit here and say I don't listen to that music like. I, I don't agree with how, you know, they sexualize women and put us in a bad light. But I'm not going to sit here and say, like, oh, I don't listen to every other song that comes on and, and has that word in it, and I don't get upset. I just know, for me, it ain't what I'm called. It's what I answer to. And I know that's not who I am. Those type of girls that they sing about in those songs, I don't do those type of things. So I don't. there's no need for me to get upset about it. Now, if I were to see, you know, a man outside and he was talking to a woman or to me crazy and, you know, disrespecting me, then, you know, my alpha female will come out. And um, so that's where you get that syndrome of, all oh, the angry black women. And it's not the fact that we, you know, are angry. We hurt, you know, we, we're tired of, you know, all of the, you know, downplay how men treat us and play with us and just, you know, move on to the next like it's nothing. That's you know where you where you get a lot of the upset from the black women. We're not angry, we hurt. I love that you know, and because like a lot of people, it surprised me because I do a lot of interviews and uh, I get interviewed a lot on podcasts. And one of the questions they always ask me is, you know, what is one of your favorite books? And it kind of shocks people when I tell them my, one of my probably top two books besides the Bible is the autobiography of Malcolm X. And about, Whoa. <laughs> You know, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> but now when he was in jail, you know, one of the big things that got out, well, one is that when he, you know, in the end of his life, he started realizing people are just people. Mm-hmm. Then also when, he, you know, they asked him, well, how was it feeling? And you know, how do you feel being in jail? He said, you may have my body in jail, but my mind is free. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. You know, so when somebody asks me questions like that, I get the same results. They're like, they scratched your head. You're like, really? One of your favorite movies? I'm like, and and books. I'm like, yeah. But I, I love it. I love it because it, it 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 gives me that affirmation that again that it it it, are, it is people out there in the world who are not of color, but they are open minded. They understand, you know, the situation. And so that's what I say. Not I, I, I would like to definitely just note that in my heart of hearts, I know not all racist people are white people or, or white people are racist. But there are just great, a lot of racist people out there who are white, and that's the truth about it. And but I know for a fact not all white people are racist, yeah. and I don't hold that against 
any white person I see walking down the street, I don't automatically see, oh, they ain't racist, they ain't gonna like me. No. I take that time to get to know that person. If they allow me to, or we come across each other and we have conversations and get to know each other, then that's why I draw my opinion from that person. Not by, you know, just walking down the street and seeing them and thinking, oh, this is just another white person. They're going to be racist towards me. No, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely that's what, you know, I, I have white people in my family. You know, like, I've dated white men before. And so, you know, like I find it funny, you know, um, I'm a big, I'm, I, I, I'm a believer. I believe that, you know, my Lord, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. But, you know, I fail him every day. But, you know, I, I start talking to me, start talking about racism and all that. And then I usually ask somebody, you know, what did Jesus really look like? You know, he did not look like Michael Bolton. He did not have blonde hair <laughs> and blue eyes. He did you not. Know, he had dark skin. He had curly hair. You know, he was from, you know, the, the mid the Middle East, you know, Mid-Eastern, Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of people, they get wrapped around the axle about the whole, you know, race racism thing. And I think we just, you know, they're, they're, we, we got to stop worrying about being black people, being white people. We got to think about people. being people. Exactly. You know what I mean? So talk Amen, about your brother. book. What was your, what is some of the feedback that you have gotten on your book? Oh, so we did do a test market analysis. Like I said, I'm a businesswoman, so I always do my homework and research before I get into something. I did do a test market analysis, and it showed me that we have four main target audience, and they are adults from the ages of 18 to 35. Uh, it did test high with women and men, but as usual, we, we women, we run it up in numbers, so we're going to do good. Um, the book also tested well with African American unity, uh, as well as people who care about social issues like this, such as injustice and systemic racism. As far as the reviews go, there are a lot of mixed reviews. Um, as far as with the negative reviews, let me just take the time to say this. Again, I'm, I'm not writing this book to, you know, cause any trouble. It does come with a disclaimer, and you will see that when you buy the book, and it tells you this is not a book that's start, meant to start any type of, you know, trouble. It's just meant to make you think and start the conversation. And for the naysayers out there who, who are saying that this book is, you know, something that it's not, please stop um, one thing that I have learned from number 45, the, the previous president, is that, you know, no matter what you do, who you are, what you stand for, there's always going to be somebody out there who's going to condone what you're doing. And so for me, you go where you celebrate it, not where you tolerate it. And, you know, so he still has 75 million people backing him, no matter what. And again, I'm not attacking, you know, Trump or anybody out there. I'm not trying to get political or anything about it, but just what I've learned from him others you know no matter what it's always going to be somebody who's going to condone what you're doing whether it be good or bad so with this book my theory is no matter what you know people say this book is going to sell it's going to be somebody out there who wants to buy this book even especially with the people you know who get to talking about it and you know they're talking about it so negatively and other people hear them they're going to be like well let me go see what this book is about and just get an opinion for myself so I, I'm actually, I welcome the negativity because, you know, that'll get, get you attention. Whether it's good or bad, people are going to be talking about it. You know, I love you know that. that's been wrong, you can't unring it. So. Yeah, and, and, you know, one thing I love, you know, like, um, I, I voted for Obama. Mm-hmm. And the re- but I did my research. You know, I read all of his books. I listened to his speeches ahead of time. Mm-hmm. I didn't just vote just yeah, exactly. to, to be popular. Exactly what I you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that we have to do our due diligence, to, you know, as far as, you know, if you're going to vote, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, you know, it's who you vote for president that really makes a difference. No, it's who you vote for the Board of Education. You know, it's who you vote in your local community. Those are the ones that are going to make the biggest difference because they're the ones that are teaching your kids. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So a lot of times it really doesn't matter who the president is because there were people that got rich during Obama. There's people that got rich during uh, Trump. There's all people. There, You're getting rich during Biden. <laughs> yeah. So there's always I'm going to get rich one way or another. <laughs> if you know, they can, why can't I? <laughs> That's how I and, feel about it. You know, I was talking to another friend of mine, and he's a man of color. And I asked him, I said, you know, because he was struggling. And then once. Um, Mr. Obama won the presidency. His thought, his thought process changed. 
And I asked him what happened. He said, because as soon as a colored man became the most powerful women, man in the world, mm-hmm. I have no more excuses. There is no glass ceiling once a black man became the, the most powerful man in the world. The, the, the glass ceiling. Oh, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, a lot of times, I think a lot of people use, you know, their their background, like you said earlier, you know, they'll use their background. Well, I grew up in Watts or I grew up in the hood and they're going to use that as an excuse for the rest of their life instead of start saying, all right, now it's my time to shine. I got to put in the work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Definitely, man. And I, I totally agree with you on that part. It, it, Let's just let's, let's stop saying like black and white for a second. Let's just say human. With anybody out there, you know, it, like I said, it is on you. Whatever you went through in life, listen, be it your your childhood, your adult, and whatever you did, even if you are the cause of the problem, and if it wasn't your 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 fault, it's still your your problem to fix. So whatever it is in life, you can't blame nobody else. You can, but in reality, it's on you. So if you never make it out your situation or that slums, it's on you. you Wait, know, can you say the opportunity is given you, but if it isn't, you go out there and make one. That's can, what I basically can you say do. Say for the people in the back. Can you say that a little bit louder? I love it. Which one? Yeah. I say a lot. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. No, no, okay. So yeah, exactly. Whether if it was or was it wasn't your fault, it's your problem and it's on you to fix it. And if you don't, then it is your fault. That's the ugly truth about it. And so if you, you know, sit around and wait and you pass, your life pass you by and you look up, that's on you. Even though somebody may have wronged you or done something to you or, you know, knocked your, knocked your shine, it's on you to get it back. And so if you see that person next to you and they taking off in their career, don't get mad whether it's black or white, Asian, Chinese, whatever, you know, don't get mad. That's on you to go out there and get this for you. That's why I say manifest, plan, and prepare. That's just true meaning by my, my motto. Manifest for what it is that you believe in your heart, then plan it out, and then prepare for it like it's coming, because it is. And so if you don't get it together, whether if it wasn't your problem, if it wasn't your fault, or you, you had nothing to do with it, it's your problem now. So it's on you to fix. That's just plain and simple. That's the ugly truth about it. And once you accept the ugly truth, you you, you get spiritually into it. That, that basically opens up your third eye. So what that means is when you get your mind right, you can get your heart together. And then anything and everything that you want, it comes to you. Any clarity that you need in your life, it comes to you. And, okay, so then I got to say, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show, I seen you in that picture in the boxing ring. <laughs> now, I ran Lennox Lewis to training camp when he was a heavyweight champion of the world. Mm-hmm. He used to fight. And so... You know, a lot of times, you know, they'll see a boxer and they have their ring corner. and But they don't realize that once they're not in that ring corner, it's whatever happens in that ring, it's your fault. You have to step out and you have to, you have to, you know, do the job. So how did you bring that mindset from, you know, coming up and and to stick to, to stick to itiveness? What was your mindset like going into the ring? Um, well, I'm an MMA fighter. I don't do boxing. I do cage fighting. <laughs> um, and, and before I go any further, I just want to take this time to say rest in peace to my coach, Saul Solis, who passed away in August from COVID. Um, he was the man that was in my corner. Uh, and going into that cage, you just got to clear all that negative doubt or anything that you feel. You can, you can channel all that negative. What I did was, you know, all that negative that I was going through, all that anger that I was feeling, I took it all out in that cage, you know. Um, so you just gotta, what he taught me is in order to be the best, you gotta do things that your opponent won't do. And you can apply that to anything, even if it's outside the cage. Whatever it is that you're trying to go for, make sure you do what your opponent, the things that your opponent doesn't do. That's what's gonna set you apart. That's what's gonna make you the best of the best. And so when I was in that cage, um, I just gave him my all and, and left it all in the cage. And so that's what I do in everything that I do. I leave it all out there on, on the mat. So that way, when it's over and done with, I don't have to look back with the what if factor. What if I would have did this? What if I would have did that? I know now. I have my answer, and I can move on. And 
And so anybody out there listening, whatever it is that you want to do in life, when you go for it, you go for it. Leave it all out there on the, on the mat. Whatever it is that you have, leave it where it's there. So when you look back on it, win, lose, or draw, at least you know you gave it your all. I love it. Last two questions I have. Yeah. Um, how do we find you? How do we find your book, and how can we support your mission? Yeah, so thank you so much for that. My website, differenceworld.net, or you can go to my YouTube channel. I'm also on Facebook. Again, my website is differenceworld.net, spelled D I F E R N T S W O R L D.net. I'm mainly on Facebook at uh, Third Eyes, or spelled T H 3 R D L L C E Y E. But you can go to my website and see all of our social media platform tagline, and you can go through there. As far as our book, uh, we are doing the pre sale this week um, through Amazon, as well as my website. So you can go to Amazon or my website, or I prefer you go to my website, differenceworld.net, and um, just so you can get the updates and information. We also have other things going on um, with the website. In association with the book, I have merchandise that I am selling solely on my website. For those who are interested, you can just go there and check it out. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, I have a book launch coming up. I'm looking to do a book tour soon, hopefully just doing what, what, whatever COVID um, got planned for us for next year. I hope and pray it lets up on us to show us some mercy. So I'm looking to do a book tour next year next year and um just the beginning you know I have, I have so many other projects in play and um not just with this book with other things i'm more than just an author a motivational speaker I, i'm i'm a woman with many hats so now that i have arrived <laughs> you will be seeing lots of me i love it um the last question that i ask everybody and because um i ask a thousand people i get a thousand different answers you know <laughs> We live in a crazy world right now. We live in a COVID world. Um, you know, a lot of people here in New Jersey lost their jobs. Mm-hmm. So we've got parents that are driving Uber, DoorDash, just to put food in their kids' mouths. Yeah. So if I ask the average American to do something in seven days, they're probably never going to get to it. Mm-hmm. But if I ask somebody to take an actionable step in the next 24 hours, they're more likely. Mm-hmm. So if there's a, a person out there, no, doesn't matter, male, female, whatever call if they're struggling in life, what is something they can do in the next 24 hours to start to get some help to straighten out their life? Talk to somebody. Talk to, even if it's to God, talking to yourself on a piece of paper, to a family member, a friend. Like I said, they have the hotline still out there. You know, call the, uh, the suicide. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're suicidal because you're calling them. They talk about, they help you with other things as well. And so, Again, everybody out there listening, it's okay not to be okay, but just don't sit there and not be okay. Go fix it. Go get help by any means necessary. Um, I hear a lot of people say, well, I can't afford a therapist. There are some therapists out there who offer free services. Do your research. Do your homework. There is no excuse. For me, I am so tired of hearing, you know, not just with the adults, but specifically when I hear, you know, teens or little kids you know going home and shooting themselves because of bullying you know that's that's a real deep-seated issue that you know that that's that's been passed along and that's where you have to break this that's a generational curse that needs to be broken a universal curse if you will and so i i say i can't say it enough man just don't sit there and not be okay don't get help don't feel ashamed about it don't be embarrassed about it because at the end of the day you're the one that's hurt. You're the one that's suffering. Nobody else, even that the person that wronged you, trust me, they're not worried about you. They moved on to the next person and doing their thing. Okay, so that's why it's all on you to get that you no know, fix. Okay. So, Normally, those are, those are the two questions that I ask, but for, for certain people, I ask one more question. Yeah, go ahead. And, um, you know, like we're talking about, we're talking about being people of faith. And they say that if you're not close to God, you're the one that moved. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If somebody out there is listening to this, um, they don't feel close to God anymore. They feel alone. What is something they can do to get closer to him today? For me, I don't mean to disrespect anybody in in the religious community, but for me, I had to lose my religion. I'm not a religious person. I am a spiritual person. And and for me, because when I was... claiming you know to be a baptist or a christian 
I, I started to please people instead of God. I started to worry about how I looked to people instead of for God. And so for me, what it took for me was removing that 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 stigma or that pressure of trying to live for people and impress people with my beliefs of God. And even if that means if you have a question, you know, where, where you are with your relationship with God, that's okay. But if you if you are a person of your faith can that's unshakable like me, even though I lost my faith, my excuse me, lost my religion, I never lost my faith. So always, you know, stay prayerful and believe that whatever it is that you're going through, it will be okay. Tough times do not last long. What I went through when I was a little girl, I knew that I was going to make it through because, you know, God told me a long time ago. I broke down on my knees praying, you know, for me to be the one in my family to break the generational curse and bring generational wealth. And he told me I was going to be the one to do that. But you got to remember that it's, it's, this life is not easy. It's not going to be. It's not meant to be those out there who expect me to have an easy life and get mad when God doesn't answer their prayers, he's not that type of God. So first of all, you have to reprogram that mindset of thinking that God answers prayers, any prayers that you want, and when he doesn't you get mad, then you're not going to make it as a religious person or as a spiritual person. You're going to eat just, you're going to you know, basically eat away at yourself with that. And so you have to understand that God is God. He is in control. Even though what he does at times, it doesn't make any sense to you then and there. Later on, it will. Because a lot of times when I was going through it, it made absolutely no sense to me. It just, it had it had to like manifest itself. It had to grow to where I got older and I can look back on it and see, well, oh, okay, I see why God had this person in my life for this certain time and then took them away. I see why that situation the door was closed on me because it wouldn't have worked out. And so sometimes in that moment, you may not understand it right then and there, but give it time, give yourself time, and give God time, you know, to let him work his plan out. Sometimes you just, you never know what's going on in the background. For me, like I said, when I lost religion and gained that spiritual side of it, I was able to understand the spiritual warfare behind the naked eye that a lot of people, a lot of us don't see. There's a spiritual battle that's being fought among us, you know, between angels and demons. And, you know, if you believe in God and have faith in him, then trust and believe that the angels are on your side and they're fighting your battles for you. They're clearing the Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to my audio interview I did with the, uh, Richard Kaufman or the Comeback Coach of the Vertical Momentum of Resiliency Podcast Show. Shit, that's trash and that shit three times fast. We'll just call it the Vertical, the Vertical Podcast Show. <laughs> but uh, definitely uh, put the info to, information down in the bio. Check him out. Uh, big shout out to him for having me on the show. As you guys saw, we talked about a lot of things, you know, overcoming uh, homelessness, me overcoming foster care, mental health awareness, as well as talking about, you know, raising social awareness through, you know, my new book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift, in which we were talking about, you know, systemic racism and injustice in America. And so with that being said, if you guys are interested, head on over to my website, differenceworld.net, and get your... <laughs> I didn't know how to do that, but go ahead and get your copy of my book, What If? A Controversial Paradigm Shift. Again, it's a book that's written to inform and encourage thought-provoking conversations about systemic racism in America. And this is done through provocative and graphic illustrations, so also be advised. It's a parental advisory here, if you guys can see it. You can read along with your children, but um, it, it's a great tool to explain to them, you know, about our past and the history, what's, you know, going on now, as well as, you know, what if for our future. And so, uh, again, go to my website, differenceworld.net, and get your copy of my book, What If a Controversial Paradigm Shift. And so, and again, big shout out to the Comeback Coach for having me on his podcast show to talk about my book, as well as my testimony and my new business, Third Eye Entertainment. Uh, what else, you guys? Let's, let's, let's end this on a good note. Um, it's been madness. <laughs> Even though it's, uh, you know, been madness, let's end this on a positive note and, you know, just doing a mental check with you guys and again reminding you all you know making sure you guys keep your mental health in check whether it being you know talking with somebody or you know doing you know a hobby you know reading meditating writing whatever it is an outlet you know that that soothes you even you know youtube and vlogging that's considered you know a hobby as well so you know pick that up too to keep you know that helps keep your mental health in check all in all just know that it's okay to not be okay but don't sit there and not be okay go get help. 
So, um, that being said, you guys, thank you so much for tuning in in today's vlog. We got many, many more coming up in the month of August, uh, especially being uh, another favorite month of mine. Uh, uh, autism awareness is near and dear to my heart, as some of you may know, my nephew who is uh, on the spectrum of autism. However, he's a bright kid, you know, uh, <laughs> you guys just see him in person. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it will, will, I'll have him in the next vlog as well. And so I got that coming up, of uh, course, a couple of travel videos and, and, and other things. So be on the lookout for that, you guys. Definitely, that's why you should hit that subscribe button and hit that notification button so you guys can be aware when I send these vlogs out and you guys can know what's going on and what's in, in different world. And so uh, that's that. Um, what else we got going? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think that's it, you guys. Just don't forget whatever it is in life that y'all want. You have to manifest, plan, and prepare for it, and then it will surely come to you guys. Difference will come and learn. Peace, 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 peace. All right, y'all. Have a good one. Bye. What if? What if in 1619 Africans started dealing in slave trading? The tables were turned around. What if they kidnapped millions of Englishmen, women, and children from their homeland and brought them to America on a slave ship? What if a controversial paradigm shift is a book written to inform and encourage consistent, thought-provoking conversations about injustice and systematic racism in America through graphic but provocative illustration? What if provides a different perspective by detailing controversial deaths and events as four categorized paradigm shifts, historical, political, precedent, and hypothetical? What if? A controversial paradigm shift by author Different. Go to differenceworld.net.